many studies concerned with lithic raw materials. This paper is not filled with description of geochemistry of rock types or geophysical properties to explain <coughs> preferences in rock. Instead, I address the phenomenon of lithic procurement practices as a social phenomenon and as social production. I base this paper on my results from analyzing, contextualizing, and comparing actions involved in the exploitation of 21 selected procurement sites in southern Norway. And without going further into detail today, I will only briefly state that it is the methodology and the theoretical premise of the Chenna Pantois <coughs> analysis which substantiate my interpretation of actions and practices expressing traditions and group identity rooted in culturally transmitted knowledge. So, just to make sure that I get to say this, just in case I run out of time, I will start by stating two things that I would like to come across in my paper here today. And these are, one, that a contextual and comparative study of lipid procurement sites emphasizing science of procurement practices can provide insights into processes of creating and maintaining social relations in prehistoric societies. And two, that, that certain extraction sites, lithic procurement practices, and selected rock types have played an important role in prehistoric societies beyond being necessary raw material for fuel production. They were significant through their association with people, places, traditions, ancestry, myth, etc. The way lithic procurement was undertaken and the manner in which places of procurement was used and reused play a strategic part in social political strategies for either setting people apart or bringing people together. I will attempt to convince you of this by demonstrating how different the exploitation of rock sources can be <coughs> and how there are differences beyond apparent physical variations. Now, just to show you what I mean with physical variation. The natural topography vary greatly between the sites. The Andes quarries that I have studied comprise dikes on headlands, deposits on islets, outcrops in the high mountain areas, veins in river valleys, and taluses in forested inland. And when selecting sites to compare, I also disregarded the type of rock quarried. Therefore, the rock types include quartzites, jasper, rhyolite, chalcedony, diabases, and greenstone. And these types of rock were employed to make different types of tools, and here divided into axes and blade and plate tools. Now, this, was ob this will obviously influence the, influence the scale of extraction, but again, there seemed to be variation even beyond this. The 21 sites I've analysed are scattered across southern Norway. They're located in different landscape zones, at the coast, in the high mountain areas, uh, along fjords and inland. So traditionally, when quarries have been interpreted, they've often been perceived as factory sites or production sites. That is, the site's scale or the rock's physical properties have been emphasised. But when their significance in a wider cultural setting has been suggested, it is the location as being either remote or risky that has been used to substantiate their symbolic or esoteric character. I find this interpretation a bit problematic, since such characterizations have perhaps more to do with our modern perception of risk and remoteness than that of the past. For example, it is, is it more or less risky for a Stone Age person to climb a mountain to quarry rock than to venture the sometimes very rough sea in a small boat to go fishing. Or, when it comes to a site being remote, one must ask in relation to what? For example, this site, Sjöldskarve, uh, is in our modern terms located relatively remotely. It is situated about 1300 meters above sea level at a mountain plateau between eastern and western Norway. The area is also covered by snow large parts of the year. However, in the surrounding area, 
around these lakes, both uh, situated in close proximity to the quarries. There are numerous sites demonstrating an active exploitation of this landscape all through the history. Thus, although perhaps seasonal and to us remote, this area was central in regards to annual mountain resource exploitation. <coughs> So uneven geographical distribution is due to two main things at least. Obviously, because we only know about a fraction of all the quarries that once was exploited. But as I believe, there is also spatial and temporal variety in preferences and traditions too. When it comes to how people in the past engaged with rock and places of procurement. So to illustrate such variation, I will show different types of contemporary exploitation and quarrying within a small geographical area. This area, the area of Bemlo, which in the smaller scale is here, and you can see they're relatively close together. They are at the mouth of the Hadangifjord in the coastal landscape where there are much Stone Age activity all through prehistory, very coastal settlements. So having investigated 21 sites, I attempted to establish a chronology of their use, and the sites I'm discussing here today were used during the early Neolithic, which is here marked with red here. Now today, of course, can be problematic, as for the most part, the use of fire does not seem to have been a common practice. Only four of the 21 quarries I looked at was the charcoal possible to date. The relation to ancient sea level proved relative, relevant in only a few situations where the sites at one point became transgressed by the sea. Typology has been the most useful me method, that is, finding traces of certain lithic technology or preforms at the quarries themselves, but in particular also at the workshop sites in the vicinity of the quarries, and also at finds at nearby settlement sites. Although the relations between these sites and the quarries are only visually established. This is not too problematic, as many of the rock types are relatively distinct. <coughs> and the distance between source and size has been kept to a minimum too. Furthermore, in the surrounding areas of the quarries I will discuss now, there are also several radiocarbon dated sites displaying contemporary use in the early Neolithic of the raw material from these quarries I'm discussing. So my estimates may be loose but the approach to each of the quarries has been consistent, and this has enabled me to compare the character of their exploitation. And before I start, there's another thing. Note that in the early Neolithic, quarrying dominates in western Norway and in the mountains. This does not mean that there are no quarries in eastern Norway. As I said, they might just not have been found yet. However, in the east, there is one large, large jasper quarry uh, that had been in use throughout the Mesolithic, but this was abandoned in the early Neolithic. Instead, in the early Neolithic in the east, flint becomes more important, and flint you cannot find um, geologically in Norway, only as flint uh, beach nodules at the beach. So flint was also imported from further south, and lithic procurement for art materials appears to have been mainly local, locally anchored. Um, and in lithic assemblages, there is still no indications of large, large scale distribution similar to that we can find in Western Norway. So, it appears that the idea of quarrying at selected places and the idea of possessing rock from specific sites is a Western characteristic in the early Neolithic in southern Norway. The exploitation of the quarry sites on and around them it varies. The size of, the, of them ranges from large to moderate and are exploited in different places. Some sites were used intensely through a relatively short time period, some more modest but over considerable time, and some being used in the immediate surrounding and during a short time period. So to illustrate this, I attempted to establish an index of the intensity of exploitation considering both scale and time frames, dividing volume of waste at the sites on summarizations of the time period's use. And although rough, this index diagram displays variations of the intensity of exploitation of each site. And some of them really stand out. So in order to start to interpret what this means, I've looked at what the raw material variation in this period at settlement sites look like, as well as the distribution patterns of the quarried rock.
Jasper from the two small quarries at Nautoya and Sjelvika was modestly used. Two, three cubic meters was quarried and used in the immediate distance of the quarry. Um, marked with red all the, all the way there. The, the quarries are the stars. And at certain sites around the quarries, Jasper make up less than 2% of the assemblages. It is greatly being unconquered by beech flint, rhyolite, greenstone, quartz, and quartzite. Hence, it does not seem like they really needed to quarry Jasper. It's not even high quality raw material, but they still did. Greenstone from the Hesperholm quarry had been in use since the mid Mesolithic. And even if its domination as adds material seemed to decline at the onset of the early Neolithic, it was still quarried and widely distributed. But it was not distributed in the same scale as rhyolite from Sigyu. The dispersal of Sigyu rhyolite is vast. A study by Knut and Leas Bergsvik, who is here today, has shown that in most, of, most of the coastal settlement sites, it makes up between 30 to 60% of the lithic assemblages, and it can also be up to 90%. But beyond the main distribution area, which is marked in red, finds are comparatively very different. At most of these sites, which are marked by the black dots, only a few flakes, some blades of fragments, and the odd point are made of rhyolite. And only in rare cases are there any regular tool production to speak of. So the distribution area is definitely demarcated. So, what was so special about the rhyolites? What made the inhabitants around Bumlo climb the top of this mountain, a landmark in the region, a quarry at the top? It's about 247 uh, meters high, and there are other deposits of rhyolite also in the vicinity. There's not really anything else to do up there. So the practice was planned and it was deliberate. They even used fire, clearly showing the surroundings, the activity happening at the top. The material was then transported far away, even into areas where equal, equally suitable and more accessible raw materials could be found. It is only a question, is it only a question of mobility, quality or accessibility? I think not. Comparing lithic procurement sites in this way makes a few of the sites really stand out. I believe these extraordinary places were significant in their contemporary society, not because their location was remote or access to them was risky, and I do not think the answer can be found in the geological properties of the different rock types either. Having been used at ordinary settlement sites, it is not even the complex that they ended up in which can indicate their contemporary value. Instead, I believe that certain rocks were, in the early Neolithic, significant by association. The idea of possessing rock from this place bound people at the western coast together. For centuries, even millennia, the inhabitants of this area have been quarrying a specific location for ads material. This is the large quarry of Hesperholmen on, on an island in the sea. This practice had created large physical scars in the outcrop, making, past, making past the past, time and generations tangible or real. And over time, quarries displaying such scars might therefore become places of ancestral presence. So to, to, to continue to quarry at them might have been the required and socially accepted practice. And echoing this, by making quarrying even more visible, in the early Neolithic, they established a new place atop Sigyu and quarried it intensely. And even small-scale quarrying, such as the Jasper quarries, was undertaken even if there was no apparent uh, need for it. Now why did they do this? I believe it has to do with the first Western encounters with impulses from the early Neolithic farming-based societies in the southeast. The early Neolithic transition in Western Norway was not really a dramatic shift. There are no conclusive evidence of a shift in agricultural subsistence and their lifestyle. Continuing to be relatively mobile, they were still hunter-gathered fishes. So I believe this was a deliberate choice to actively maintain status quo in the face of external impulses. It is a delayed Neolithization process we may say. So reifying their links to the past, to ancestral presence, and their rights to land and resources, they used rock associated with a significant place, and quarrying there, or quarrying as a communicative act in itself, continued the traditions of their ancestors. And this was a way to keeping the new at bay. Thank you. <laughs>